Life Rhythms with Ryan Skye. Observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. Welcome to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Skye. Life Rhythms is a radio show that revolves around my personal growth journey. As a DJ and a producer, I spend a lot of my time observing the world around me, looking inward, trying to make sense of it all. I've been doing it in song form and now I do it with my radio show. Each episode of Life Rhythms, we feature one guest in one song and I choose a personal growth topic around the song. I'm excited for today's episode. We've got Punctual, the electronic duo Will and John and Lewis Thompson joining us today. And we're going to be featuring their song Fever, which you just heard a little snippet of coming into this opening. I'm excited to talk about Fever because the metaphor of of sickness and if having a fever when you're in love and those initial stages of limerence, that fascinates me. It's it's a it's a metaphor that has a history of being used in poetry and songs and in various literary forms for hundreds of years. So I'm, I'm excited to dive into and unpack this song with the guys and talk about the history of the song, how it came about, their take. When we get back, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to be talking with Punctual and Lewis right after this on Adobe Radio. Welcome back to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky. I've got with me guests today, Will and John from the electronic duo Punctual and Lewis Thompson. Hey, guys. Yo. What's good? Yo, how's, how's it going? going? And y'all, you are, you're joining me from, you're all in London. Yeah, yep. yeah. So we're actually really close at the moment. We're at our studio in Fulham and Lewis is literally five minutes away. Yeah, in my front living room. So... Yeah. And I'm, I'm 5,000 miles away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. I'm glad to have you guys on today. We're featuring your single Fever, which you guys, we just played a little snippet of it coming into this segment. And I want to talk about Fever because when I was prepping for this episode, I was thinking about like the, the, the Fever metaphor. And I was like, what? I know what it means when I hear a song, but I, I really wanted to figure to talk more about that metaphor, it's been used, there's a history of it being used. And, and what is it about that that draws songwriters, and not even just songwriters, but poets and authors, to use that metaphor to describe the feeling of falling in love, desire, and kind of like what it does to us during that those initial stages of limerence and and it, it almost like is a possession, right? So I want to talk to you guys about the song. How did it come about? We initially started the idea um, with another songwriter called Height, who's like incredible. Who coincidentally we were actually working with today. Yeah. Who's just and coincidentally I was doing a podcast with today. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So shout out Height. And I think it started, the whole idea started from trying to find something that sort of felt old school, sort of almost like Motown, you know, that kind of vibe and turn it into sort of a new, like, disco records sort of 2023 style i guess turn it into a get get our style on on board and i think it really started to take shape when lewis got involved and you know beefed it up and just made it sound basically incredible um like a finished record really yeah yeah so it's sort of it, it's a long process with the song but yeah really happy where it turned out who's it, it singing a, on it i would say so it's, it's our friend tim okay. tim deal height and I, I would say this song is is quite an unorthodox way of making a song, really, isn't it? Because Tim kind of had this hook, but he was like, oh, "It feels really, it feels too old." That was I remember him saying, "Like it feels too old." Mm. This, this is like classic Tim as well. He he feels like he always says like he would been a, he would have been so successful had he been like thirty years younger. Um, <laughs> Thirty years older, so thirty years older. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's also so, <laughs> so he had he had this hook, and then yeah, we basically thought oh, that that almost sounds like an old sample. So let's kind of speed it up, pitch it up. Yeah, and, sort of add elements to which make it feel. To the intro of the track, sort of feels like it could be a record from you know forty years ago. Like you you don't know and when it kicks in, you're like oh. Wow, it sort of takes you by surprise almost. Mm. Um, 
which is sort of the effect we want to do. It yeah, does. I, I was re-listening to it on the way to the studio today and it's funky and it's got that that like classic vibe to it. And I, I notice, especially in my car, when the when the beat actually kicks in, it's it's a, it's a bit surprising but satisfying. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh wow, yeah, it's full. The drums mm-hmm. are yeah. full and the bass is full. Yeah, I think. I mean, we wanted to keep that sort of tension, and we wanted to keep it sounding like a sample for as long as possible. So just before the drop, that's the first time it sort of starts being chopped up, which is like so you're like. You were not expecting it until really the drop. It's sort of you, you, th- that's the first time it's sort of given away that it's you know more of a modern take, I guess. It's very satisfying as a DJ when I play stuff and it, it doesn't have that. It, it it it's just night and day difference in the, in the club space in terms mm-hmm. of getting people moving. Like I would love to play this record out. You'll have you know? to do it, and you'll have to send us some yeah, videos. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting <laughs> that you that's talked how it about. Goes for sure. It's cool that you guys talked about it being a um, kind of like starting out as a classic record. I don't know how many people listening know this, but house music started out from disco records being sped up. Exactly. Right? And that, that's how I started getting into making music myself because I, I didn't know how to play anything. So when I first started kind of producing songs, I would just go and basically steal a, a section of an old disco record and then kind of speed it up and... And this, Which, this is when you were in university, right? Was this? Yeah. yeah, that was kind of yeah. Basically, that was how I started making tunes. I got I used to listen to Daft Punk and Cassius and stuff like that, and I kind of saw that's what they did. So then it was really fun with this record to kind of take that approach again, even though it was something that was newly written. It was newly yeah. written, but written with old intentions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's and the look- next thing going to be? That's the, you know, I want to know what music's going to be like in fifty years' time. I thought the next wave was going to be, I thought it was going to go back to like the anthemic, kind of like the peak when it was the, like the EDM bubble, the anthemic music with the soaring vocals. But I'm noticing it's speeding up now. There's a lot of the sped up music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'd say it's the TikTokification of music. You've got like the higher pitched vocals, the sped up, right? I see mm-hmm. it. I hear it a lot. TikTokification, I love that. I mean, right? it's so true. But I mean, TikTok so really... The way I see it is TikTok, all these records were sped up to get sort of those hooks or get the lyrics across in a short 15 second video. So they had to speed up the vocal, the vocal, this whole track to be able to get it in that little segment. Yeah. And so when that started becoming popular, people's ears get used to it. And so they want original records like that. Yeah. It's sort of, it's, it's odd the way it worked out. And stuff just sounds slower after that. Yeah. It's yes. like if you over salt your food, you, know, you put loads of salt in your food and then you don't have it with salt and you're like, this is rubbish. When I, when I hear it faster and then I hear the slower version, I'm like, I can't unhear the fast version anymore. I want the fast version. And yeah, the way yeah. that the, the, the way that the vocals pitch up a little bit, it also helps with TikTok because it, it's, it's like cuter, you know? So like people, people are dancing to it and they're mouthing to it and it, it kind of plays into the like being cute and you, it, it really just, it plays into it for me. I think it's also interesting even looking at, what people are wearing and what like what people often wear is kind of like that era of fashion is also reflected in what's going on musically. Okay. So like when you play like nineties vibe is just like everyone's dressing like that right yeah. now. And like flare trousers and stuff and like Yeah, it's going that way, isn't it? And I think even Calvin with this tune has like he's just fully tapped into the nostalgia of like nineties Almost Euro dance. Yeah, Euro dance, yes. And yeah. and that is kind of reflected in what people are wearing and what people are how people are partying and things like that. It's it's really interesting. It's, yeah. It's sort of the same cycle as well. I mean, before everyone was doing 80 sounds, you know, it's like the weekend or whoever it is, and 80 it's yeah. recreating 80s is a big thing. And I said, yeah. like, the next thing is recreating the 90s. It'll only be, in the pop sphere, honestly, there'll be songs that sound like you know, Backstreet Boys or yeah. you know, anything Max Martin did in, in four <laughs> years' time. And it would be like, oh, that's so 90s. That's so sort of nostalgic. Because ha- having something that appeals to a two decades below appeals to the parents' generation as well as the young generation. Yeah. So it's, it, it's like a sweet pocket, you know, yeah. for popular music. I was just having this conversation the other day and I was saying, I'm, I'm curious when the 90s trend is over and 
and culture starts moving on to the next trend, I wonder if they're going to actually just like kind of skip over the early 2000s or if there's actually going to be a moment of sampling and remaking early 2000s. Because in my opinion, that was kind of a low point in in the in music, it, you know, like the pop and pop music. Well, some yeah. classic there was a lot of cheesy stuff. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. It was very pop, I think. Super, uh, super like contrived and and almost like uh, there there were like the ingredients, right? It was like very structured and mm. like then, a machine. Like, lots of like the sort of, there was, you know, there's lots of like um, house flips. You probably can't, I'm not sure what, if these were necessarily from the noughties or the nineties, but like obviously that was really great music then. But yeah. 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 I, I, I sort of do worry as well, you know, if a whole generation copies the nineties, copies the eighties and then copies the nineties, when it comes to 20 years time, they can't copy us copying the 90s. <laughs> like, what's, That's an interesting what's, point. Like, yeah. Stuff. <laughs> there are so many flips right now. There's so many remakes right now. Yeah. That that that's interesting. I mean, there's there's still some stuff that's cutting through. It's nice to see the remakes. Mm. When they're I done think, well. Yeah. I do think dubstep's gonna have a comeback though. You mean just saying. I think so too. Yeah. I'm starting to get requests for it. I got some the other day. I was I got somebody asked me to play trance and dubstep. I got that in one night. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Trance, trance really is back in quite a big way. Yeah. Here. It feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Like in the UK, there's like, like Ben, I, I was watching Ben Hemsley and Shaq set from yeah. that big weekend thing. And they're, they're playing like 160, like hard house. Yeah. Mm. It's pretty wild. It's intense. Like, yeah. It's really intense. But like two or three years ago, it was like 120 kind of deep house was, was mm. the vibe. Mm-hmm. Like anything above one twenty seven was fast. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah, it's tricky because it, it the faster you go, especially say it's on a radio show or something. If your your records after somebody else's record, your records one two four, they've just played a sort of one three eight speed garage tune. Yours just sounds way more boring. It's just like what's up there? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Mm. It's interesting. interesting. What, I don't know. What is it like when D, I'm curious about DJing in the, in in the UK versus the states because I've noticed in the, in the span of a few years, like I'd say maybe even just like five years ago, DJing here, I would be playing house records of popular songs, and I would have people come up to me and be like, and say like. Why are you playing so much techno? Like, are you gonna be playing techno all night? And they were, they just they wanted hip hop. They wanted like straight up, oh. straight up hip hop. Yeah. And it's definitely not that vibe anymore. Now it's I can play, I can play the fast music. I can play 140, 145. I can play a lot of the remakes that are happening, and and people love it. They want it. It's such a short time frame for the ear to progress for people's ears to progress at least here in the states so i'm curious what's it what's it like in the uk dj like what trends I, I have you noticed like in the uk the overground the underground is now like almost commercial like it it's definitely more popular to play underground stuff if you played a set now in the uk that was like quite heavily vocal house people would say it's too commercial okay yeah it, it sort of depends where you play but like if you're playing on like a cool lineup like yeah people People don't really play like commercial leaning stuff. Mm. And what do you consider yeah. commercial? Just, I, th- I always think like if you're playing out in a club and you're playing a song, I know this sounds really basic, but if you're playing a song with a verse, pre and a chorus, yeah. people just aren't interested and don't like it. It's sort of people want something more repetitive, really, than that. You know, they just want the same hook and sort of like build it up. a bit like Fever does. It's sort of basically just the same hook most of the time. Um, you know, that's what people are wanting. It can be sort of vocal driven, but um, just not song based, basically. That it's almost sense. like a lot of the the kind of bigger DJs will have their, their kind of pop version of the song that will work on radio. And then they'll do like like a, like a VIP, a VIP edit. Yeah. Yeah. For their sets, which is just totally different. And that kind of seems to be what happens in the UK. I do find it a bit strange, if I'm honest, because... People are going to see a DJ who's played on radio. Like they probably want to hear the. You would think anyway that they'd want to hear the radio song, but yeah, they, they, they tend to do that more when they have like you know like a PA performance or whatever. Yeah, but that would be that would be probably more. You know, say you're playing like 
I guess this isn't the UK, but something a bit like Ibiza Rocks or whatever. Like they'll probably play, if they're doing half an hour set, they'll probably just smash through all the singles and yeah. that'll be that. Mm, but like, if it's like, you know, if you're at Printworks or you're at Fabric or whatever, like it's going to be like, you know, take like Joel or something, you know, it'd be like, bah, 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 tech drop. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, I guess if you're doing a show where it's hard tickets and you've, you're the, you're literally the act, you're the headliner. And it's like people are there to see you. You can sort of play your song. But if you're playing on a lineup, a lot of the people in the crowd probably don't even know who they're watching. Genuinely, they're just kind of there, just like you know, having a good time. It's different DJs coming on and off, and they don't want to hear songs. Basically, I, I always found that really different when playing in North America. Like, and, and I always used to love that about playing in North America is people came to DJ gigs, how they would go to like band gigs in the UK. Yeah. Like they really were there. Like I remember like walking onto the stage and people were like just there watching you. Like you were mm. a band just setting up, plugging your guitar in and they were like there. And which is just, you just wouldn't have that in, in the UK. And I, I always really liked that about North America. There is yeah. an element of that here. It, it catches me off guard sometimes when I'm DJing. Like sometimes I'll forget to play my songs and then somebody in the audience will like put it on their phone and they'll like show me the phone and ask for one of my songs. And it's like, oh my God, yeah, of course I'll play that song. You <laughs> know? Play it five times in a row I'm now. like, Thank oh my you. God, yes, yes, yeah. We, we had that. We had played a festival this summer and there's sort of a group of girls, maybe like five or six girls on the front row, the whole set. And we were just playing sort of like, other people's music, just a normal DJ set. And we sort of ended our set with one of our songs and they all like went mental. Like they'd been waiting there for about one and a half hours to watch for us to play this. Oh, oh, really bad. I was like, I was like, oh no, like, we could have, could have been doing this all, yeah, could have played more of them. Could have got better, better reactions for longer. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I feel like it, people in North America want that more, which I, I always really liked. It, it felt, it felt good for that reason. Okay. Hold that thought. I want to get the people's perspective on this topic of fan culture in America. So we're going to take a quick break and I'm in the car right now. I'm going to turn on the rideshare app and I'm going to pick up a passenger and I'm going to ask them. I want to get, I want to hear what they have to say about fan culture in America. And then we'll get back to our conversation with Punctual and Lewis Thompson. All right. So turning on the app, let's see who we get. And I was kind of suspicious about it. Your Hi. Hey. Hi. How you going? Wow, you're festive. Yeah. <laughs> like, give me a surprise or don't give me a surprise. Either way, I'm happy. Well, I have a surprise for you. Okay. What is, what is it? Because you're actually, I, I'm part of a pop-up thing right now. Really? I have a radio show in LA oh, on Adobe Radio, and we do a segment where I drive rideshare and I interview the passengers. It's called The People's Perspective is the name Cute. of the segment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this week, the guests that I had on my show, they're from the UK. Thinking about, they were saying like in the US, we have like a fan culture here that they don't have in the UK. What are things that you've been obsessed with? Or like, what is the longest you've waited in line for something? Oh yeah, wait, 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 wait. The only thing that I have ever waited in line for is to see Twilight in theaters. Like the final movie. Oh. Yes, like I waited all day How in long? line. So you would wait like it's three really or four fun. hours and then you could go and start the movies. But it was never more than five hours. But you waited five hours? I would wait a lifetime. I was what was it? Twilight yeah, too. what was it about Twilight? Why did you love it so much? Because I was like 12 and I loved the love story of the toxicity between them. So I didn't know what love meant. So you were just like fantasizing, like, I want this for myself someday. Yeah. It was a drama and the intensity. When Twilight, the Twilight came out, me us. and my sister were obsessed and our mom bought it for us on DVD and we watched it like 50 times on repeat to the point where my mom took the DVD back. She was done. She had had She it. couldn't take the movie yeah. you played anymore? Yeah, no. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Day. You too. Have a good one. Bye. We did it. We opened up the conversation. We got the people's perspective. I am excited now to dive back into my conversation with Lewis Thompson and Punctual on Adobe Radio. Yeah. Why do you think there is a, a difference there between North America and UK? I, I look at like, I went to Austin when I was in America and I, was, I walked past this place and there was a queue of people outside this, this Tex-Mex place. 
the queue was like two hours. And I was like, that wouldn't happen in England. Mm. Like people wouldn't queue. Like why are people there queuing? And I just think that people there are, are more passionate about things like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know why, but like food and music, you guys are more passionate about than us, I think. And maybe reality TV. <laughs> well, we got a lot of that as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. don't know. It just, there is a why. fan culture here. There is definitely a fan culture here. Yeah. I feel like, I don't know what it's like for you, but I really feel like in the UK, especially in dance music, it's very much like a sort of a playlist culture. Like people just have their playlists. They have their songs they like, but they don't follow artists really that much. They just they just in their own bubble of the songs they like, and if they find a song they like, they put it to their playlist. And like, you know, I'll have friends who will play a song, say of ours, and they're like, "Oh, I know this song. Didn't even know it was you." And I was yeah. like, well, "That's well, who do you think it was?" They're like, "I didn't really check. Didn't look." Yeah, you know, it's just a song I like. It's so, so yeah. I don't know why that'd be different in America, you know, in America than it would be here, but. Um, I think, sure. yeah. I guess just now nowadays, you, it's well, at least back in the day when you you know you'd find an artist that you like and you'd have to go and find their albums and you'd have to do that. But you don't really have to do that now. It's so easy with yeah. all the playlist stuff. Um, mm. Yeah. How are you guys with requests during your sets? We generally play. I mean, if it's our music, we will always play it. If it's you know Ignition R Kelly in the middle of a house set. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 at university, on the I was doing a set. Um, in, a, in a town called Bath City, a city called Bath. Anyway, and this girl came up to me and she's like, "Can you play hip hop?" And I was like, "It's a house set. Like we, we book yeah. play house. Like that's why we're here." Prime example. Like, Nobody would like hip hop here. Yeah. Like, I was not being nice about it. Yeah. She's like, "No, play hip hop. Like I don't want to hear house." And I was like, "It's a house night." And she got her vodka coke and threw it on my laptop and like wow. broke it, and all the sound went off. Wow. I was like, "Well, <laughs> wow." <laughs> you done that? It's like unbelievable. So, obviously, a yeah, bad history of requests. To be honest. And that's why we always do them now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps the set interesting. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a drunk girl. I was DJing at a gay club and I had a drunk woman request like a like punk music, like punk. And mm. I was like, I'm pretty good with requests, but I was like, there's literally nobody here wants to hear that song. I was like, I don't have that. She was asked for things I don't have. And I was kind of thinking about what I have. And I was like, I have like, I have Nirvana. I have a remix of Nirvana. I could play that. She's like, okay, yeah, sure. So I mix into Nirvana and literally as the track starts playing, she's leaving. She's walking out, leaving. Oh man. <laughs> like, Did you quickly play another one? Yeah. yeah I was like, Whoop. Bitch, this is for you. You know, come on, girl. This is for you. No, <laughs> she was just drunk. But... Well, what? Because they'll, they'll do what you've got to be careful because it's almost like give someone an inch, they'll take a mile. Like you'll give, you'll give them a request and then they'll be like, right, Some now have you got this? Yeah. And then you think, yeah. Nah, yeah. I've got this all night. I remember once again, and I I didn't you tell me if you guys would know what to do in this situation, but I, I had someone come up to me and said, right, I need the happy birthday song. <laughs> Like you need to play yeah, the happy birthday song. Yeah. And I was like, wait, is that actually like is that actually a song? Like, where's the MP3 for that? Like I, was that this a song. Stevie Wonder version or, or Oh I or, said I, I said I might have the Stevie Wonder version. They were like, no, 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 the happy birthday song. Oh the original. I, like, I don't know what about that. You should have faded out and sung it yourself, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I was thinking like, should be like, get on the mic then. You sing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like getting requests because to me it's market research. I mean, like they're literally telling me what they want to hear and what they're listening to. And there's definitely gems. Like there's times where I'll get requests of things I've never heard of, or I can I can kind of like gauge the culture and kind of see what's bubbling up from it. Yeah, yeah that's something. That's really yeah, that's, yeah. You take that to the studio as well. Yeah, yeah. And even if I don't have it, I'll make a note of it and I'll just look it up and listen to it because I'm curious. But yeah. but a lot of DJs get, are kind of snobby about it. They don't they don't like requests. They kind of like take it personal. Like their set isn't good enough. I understand that. Yeah, I get that. I get both sides. It, yeah. it kind of depends on the setting and and the venue and definitely de yeah definitely depends on that. Like sometimes it's not appropriate to play a birthday song or get on the mic and do a birthday shout out to somebody. Who's like no no that's not happening. Not not here. Yeah. yeah, in in like Bergheim or something like 
They're like, yeah, imagine. They're like, imagine. but it's my I friend's have, birthday. It's like, great. Happy yeah. birthday. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're at the end of segment one. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're, I want to dive into the song, Fever. Cool. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Life Rhythms Radio Show. I'm your host, Ryan Sky. I've got Punctual, the electronic duo Will and John, as well as Lewis Thompson with me. And we just featured their song, Fever. We played a little bit of it. And guys, I want to dive into this song in the second segment. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I was look, looking online, researching about the history of fever as a metaphor for love. And the predominant results came up was actually a Shakespearean sonnet. It's right. sonnet number 147 written in 1609. So wow. here's the metaphor being used over 400 years ago. I thought right. that's, that's pretty cool because I, I was wondering about, pretty, right? What, so what you're saying basically is we're basically Shakespeare. Basically <laughs> reincarnated <laughs> children of Shakespeare. Possible that he copied us, though. That's also possible. Yeah. (laughs) And I want to... So, yeah, I was looking at this sonnet. And I I usually write a quote for every episode. In this case, I'm going to quote the interpretation of the sonnet because reading the actual sonnet, you know, has that old English for the old English language and it's it's not as easy to understand. But the interpretation I thought was interesting and, and could be a good jumping off point for the topic. So, sonnet... It's 147. Basically, the the interpretation goes like this. My love is like a sickness that wants nothing more than the one thing that will make this disease last longer. It feeds on the very thing that's making me so ill in an attempt to satisfy my sickening appetite. My sense of reason, which is like a doctor treating my love sickness, is furious that I haven't followed any of his advice. He's abandoned me, and now I know that my desire will kill me, something he could have prevented. Wow. Wow, I wish, wish we'd uh, <laughs> no, 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 use that as inspiration for the lyrics in the verse. Well, that's the mid late sorted, guys. That's yeah, the yeah, 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 but give us a note. This is, is the bridge. Favorite. This is the bridge that you were going to put <laughs> in your song. The rap version that comes out. <laughs> the interesting parallels to me is that with, with Fever, because with your lyrics... I love I love the song Fever. It's it's a fun celebratory song and your lyrics are I get a fever baby whenever you're around and it but it, specifically I love the don't you know I want it don't you know I need it. So this person also wants the fever to last longer. They love it. They want it. They're they're asking for more of it. And Shakespeare's sonnet is kind of the same thing. It's like they know that it's a sickness but he wants it to last longer. And mm. it's also the Shakespearean sonnet. This is an interesting parallel with Lewis is the Shakespearean sonnet. It's basically about the battle between head and heart. <laughs> and Lewis, you've written about that. You, you were part of, right? Head and heart. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? And that's what the, the song, that's yeah. what this is about. It's about my head won something, but my heart. Mm. want something else it's kind of the juxtaposition isn't it and that that kind of juxtaposition is just all over pop pop music yeah talking about love as a sickness and a cure is mm. kind of like what Shakespeare's doing there and, and that's kind of what Fever does as well isn't it it's it's um, yeah it's that weird feeling of like I guess the sickness is something bad but love is something that's so good and that kind of juxtaposition is quite interesting to people yeah, I mean it's it's funny it's funny sort of because when you have a fever it's so sort of all encompassing right it sort of you know takes over it's basically I don't know certainly when I'm ill it's like a lot of what I think about weirdly you know when, sort of, when you're super ill your mind's focused on it so much that it sort of feels like the only thing that really matters at that time and obviously and you know when you fall in love it's really similar right it's sort of just the only thing you're thinking about basically. Yeah. and it's sort of uh, yeah and you can't get rid of it there's no yeah, you, know, you can't you can't do anything to sort of um, yeah lose the fever you see what I mean mm. yeah when when it first starts you, you enter into a state of limerence mm. you know and like, I haven't heard that word in so long by the way I, I love that word I do too limerence yeah, I, don't know, I don't know anyone else that's ever used that word but I, I've always I I'm not sure what that word means it 
from what I understand and what I remember reading, it's that very initial, you can tell me if I'm wrong, right? But it's that very initial period that you meet someone and it's, you know, it's, you know, when you first fall in love, basically, and it's exciting, you want to spend all your time with this person. When you're not around them, you're thinking about them. It's, it's kind of like a feet, like what you're saying, like the fever. Yeah. It's, it can be defined as an involuntary state of intense desire. And it basically limits his intrusive and obsessive thoughts, feelings, and behavior from euphoria to despair, contingent on perceived emotional recipro recipro reciprocation. So intense desire towards somebody. So like this intense desire and wanting them to reciprocate. But it's involuntary. It's like no matter how hard you try, you're just like ruminating about this person. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you can't choose when you fall in love and you can't choose when you get ill. It's just something that happens. <laughs> yeah, it kind of like possesses you. It kind of grabs you, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there are sort of other par parallels in terms of like, you know, fever could raise your heart rate, right? And it, sort of, it makes you sort of, you know, hot. Actually, that's sort of a bit rude, but it sort of <laughs> <laughs> raises your heart rate and it's sort of, you know, it's very intense, you know. I guess mm. this is what, the same with limerence. Mm -hmm. It also runs its course too. Lim limerence doesn't last forever. So yeah, th that. There, there's certainly like a ramp up period. There's that intense period of limerence and then it, it fades. Mm. And yeah. some people call it the honeymoon phase whenever you're dating. You know, it's like that first year. Mm -hmm. Because the mind always seeks equilibrium. It can't, it can't maintain this state forever. It has to find equilibrium. So it eventually balances itself out again. Yeah. And I yeah. think I think there's an evolutionary or a, or a biological element to it because it does help us pair bond. It does help us focus on somebody. I mean, it's it's almost like nature's way of like forcing us to focus on someone enough long enough to go through the stages of bonding and mating and you know Wow, that's so interesting. That's so true. You're you're right. I think you're onto something. It has there. to be, yeah. 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 So you sort of build that. It's kind of like obsession that leads to attachment, basically. Yeah, because what's interesting is that when I was researching this, they they've studied the brain in limerence and in love and in like those initial stages of love, and actually the brain um, it mimics the same state as obsessive compulsive disorder. Your right. serotonin levels drop in both obsessive compulsive disorder and in limerence. And it causes a hype, this like hyper focus and rumination on one thing. Mm. That's interesting. Well, so you're like, you're, you're less happy when you're like not with the person in a sense. Yes. So like mm -hmm. you need it to make yourself feel good. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm. We've, all been there. We've all been there. And you do silly things. Like I have, I think back to like my, my experiences. I, there's things I've done that I'm like, I cringe. I'm like, that wasn't me. What was I, what was I thinking? You know, but it's like, what, you, it's what, like what I become they, a different person. We're gonna go through this? What? <laughs> we're going to go through these. We can. Think yeah. Stupid things you've done. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Let me think. Let me think. Um, yeah, I've, I've just, I've done silly things like, like during a breakup and I've like stalked the person, like creating like a, a, a separate Instagram account so that I could view their stories without them seeing me view their stories, you know, or even when we were dating, like kind of like uh, w obsessing over their activity, like who are they talking to? Who are they commenting? Who are they liking? Who are they following? It's, it's a lot of insecurities that, that mm. got stirred up for me that I didn't realize were there that I had to work yeah. through. I, I guess it's, you know, your brain not knowing what to do. Right. So it's sort of just coming up with any sort of, um, you you build a rationale behind what you're doing. Your brain sort of gives you that sort of rationale because you're so intensely focused that you sort of forget about you know, the other consequences of your actions, right? You know. Yeah, it's like it, it's basically a fear of loss. It's like you want it so much to work out that you're afraid of losing it. That you, me at least, not not speaking for everybody, but there were times where I did things to try to maybe like see if I if I was safe, see if like things were good between us but the very actions that i was taking to try to like shore it up were the very things that push the person away oh yeah been there 
<laughs> but what's interesting was the pain that it caused me from pushing the person away then led me to go search and learn about my behaviors and start to heal and like work on myself. Like I learned about like attachment theory and, and mm. like what, what were the underlying issues there? <laughs> it is like what you said. It's like sort of fear of like fear of not having that person because you didn't think that something else would come along. But then actually after the whole breakup and you realize things get better, then as you get older, you're like, oh yeah, like you just be a people that make you happy. And like, if they're not going to be with you, then they weren't the right person. It's like less complicated. Yeah. But it's so hard when you're going through that. Like when you're going through that that breakup process, you lit, it, it, you can't think straight. Like it, it is almost it is literally like a sickness, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, so you feel, you literally feel it in your gut, right? So you feel yeah. like something's not yeah. right, and you feel so anxious and sort of you know yeah, yeah. totally. It's it's very physical in a in a it's way. Very physical, yeah. yeah. Just like a fever. <laughs> it's a fever gone bad when it when there's the breakup. Yeah. Like a flu. Like a flu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's all over all all of that is just all over pop music as well. You've got the kind of negative side of love. This kind of just shows that just love is just rooted in all of pop music because the negative side of love is just all over yeah. pop, pop music as well. I, was, I actually quite often find that's a lot easier to write about in songs than the kind of positive side of love. It is, yeah. And especially, you know, um, if you're writing sort of dance songs, which is generally sort of upbeat and kind of make people want to feel good and, ha and happy, it's nice to have that sort of juxtaposition between yeah. sort of like meaningful lyrics with sort of these upbeat, you know. Totally. Drum. Like an, an I Miss You song is always easier. I think I always find like just if the sentiment is just I miss this person, it, mm -hmm. if you it just feels a lot easier to do. If you write a song that's just you're great and I love you, well, that's hard. It's well, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think people sort of turn to music when they need it. You know, it's like yeah. a friend or something to a lot of people, and it's like yeah. that shoulder that you might need. And I think like yeah, it's just, yeah. There's there's less of a purpose maybe to music, which is just like everyone's happy and everything's good because you're like. Because everyone's unfortunately everyone's not <laughs> exactly um, yeah life doesn't work like that. There's you you have love and you have pain and music's yeah. probably a bit of a, a bit of a therapy to to most mm. people. E even in songs which are sort of overtly happy, you know, songs which like yeah, I'm addicted to you, all that kind of thing. But the, the, the to be addicted is actually not not, not a positive thing, positive thing, right? But it's sort of you always have to have some sort of balance between, you know, you know, these sort of happy, like, you know, um, positive lyrics with sort of juxtaposed with basically, yeah, negative things at the same time. Sort of adds that sort of nuance to the songs. Mm -hmm. Negative feelings also grab our minds a lot more than positive. Mm. They have more of a, a, a pull on us mentally. So it would make sense to me that it would be easier to write the negative, the negative or the sad songs. I mean, especially from like a survival standpoint, you feel like anything that's negative is potentially dangerous, right? So if the mind is trying to keep us safe, like it's going to definitely be more interested in looking out for like the saber tooth tiger than it is mm -hmm. for just ha enjoying the sunshine and, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. So yeah. that 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 I, I could see. How do you guys try to write one versus the other? Like w w in terms of like the the sad or the happy? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd like to try and get a good balance of everything in the songs. There needs to be like all my my kind of songwriting approach is always to try and just get the kind of duality of hope and pain into a song. There's okay. a little bit of pain. You know, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you, whatever. And then, but maybe, maybe something will happen one day. That like, just that message is kind of, kind of important. Whereas if it's just, I miss you, you're gone. I miss you, you're gone. I don't know. I don't know. I just like a little bit of hope, basically. In yeah. There. Don't want to make it too, too Radiohead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do too. I don't like to perpetuate. I don't like to perpetuate lyrics that I feel like are unhealthy. Like for instance, like I can't live without you. I'm nothing without you. I, I don't mm. want to perpetuate something that like puts somebody on a pedestal in an unhealthy way. And then now that, now that message is proliferating all over the world. 
And people were like, yeah. yeah, that's right. I can't live without this person. It's like, I don't really want to be putting that into people's minds. That's a really good way of thinking about it. Definitely. Yeah. I thought about that. Yeah, music's really powerful. Like, it's crazy. Like, I get so many messages from people and they're like, oh, this song's really helped me through this this difficult time and it's about this. And I'm like, it's definitely not about that. <laughs> But I love it. I love that it's helped you. Like it's amazing. Mm. That is that is such a nice thing about music, where people fuck so can relate to lyrics and find their own meaning in lyrics. That's why sometimes when lyrics are quite, you know, vague, vague and sort of you know, um, non nondescript, it's it's nice that people can sort of find their own meaning in it. The same with you know, you know ballet is such a big thing, and people there's no you know words at all, and people find their own meaning in what people are doing when they're dancing it's sort of you know Mm. that's true yeah sometimes when i'm djing i have this like out of body experience where i'm 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 djing and i'm playing music and i'm watching people dance to the music and it just kind of hits me it's like this is so weird that i'm doing something and then like all of these other people in front of me are responding to it and it's like even dancing is really weird if you think about it. It like is the, weird, I agree. If you think about what <laughs> dancing is, it's quite weird. Like, yeah. Rhythms, just, it, I don't know, it shows kind of how primal we probably all are without realising there's these rhythms of melody floating around in the air and we interpret them and it makes us move in all these weird ways. It's, it's, it's pretty special. Even babies dance. Yeah, 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 yeah. they do. They, like babies love music, so it shows that it's so intuitive. It's so rooted in us, mm. uh, which is, is cool. it. Sort of gives people confidence. You know, music gives people confidence to be able to do that and express themselves. Have you ever been to a silent disco where everyone's dancing and then you take the headphones off and it's completely silent in there, but everyone's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it's such an, a weird sight. <laughs> I mean, like, so weird. Without the context, the music is just such an odd thing. Mm. Yeah. What What are your dance moves like as DJs? Do you guys Do you guys dance? Are you animated <laughs> or are you reserved? Quite a keen fist pumper. Yeah. yeah. It's quite a classic one. <laughs> do, I, think, do, I, I think I started DJing at uni so I didn't have to dance because I'm such a bad dancer. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was sort of one of the best things about it. <laughs> uh, I still have to do dance. Do, yeah, do, do you do pumper, like the step yeah. touch, like side to side and like. No, no, a lot no, of hand no. movements, no? Sort of a lot of, sort of that. Side bopping. That. It's when, if it's that, the tune's kind of good. If it's that, we really... That's, <laughs> you're really, really into it. <laughs> I, always find, I always find that if you're having fun, you're kind of just dancing. Like, it is, it is such a fun feeling. Like, I really... I actually... Last summer, I actually went out. This sounds, this sounds really weird. I went out with my, a few of my friends... And I didn't drink anything and I actually just went out dancing <laughs> and I had like a, such a good time. I really enjoyed it. So I think if you're DJing and dancing, there's a good chance that the DJ's having fun. Yeah, definitely. Depends, depends on the kind of music. If I'm in sort of like a, at a wedding or something Oof. and Justin Timberlake comes on, I'm on the dance floor straight you away. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll dance to that. I will, <sighs> I'll dance to that. I don't care how it looks. I can't fake it though. Like if I'm not into the music, I want to be into it. But if I'm not into it, I just can't. Like I, I was at my brother's wedding a few months ago and I did not dance to any of the music. It was just, it really? was, yeah, it was all like, do you know the song like pour some sugar on me? Pour some sugar on me. It was all like music like that, like 80s right. rock stuff. And I just, I was like, ugh, I just can't. You're, you're at the front handing like, requests. <laughs> no, yeah, right. Well, no, the the DJ he wasn't. He was sitting down and he was just literally playing songs on a sitting laptop. Down. He wasn't. He wasn't even mixing songs or anything. He was. He was just playing on the laptop. And I guess my brother he requested that, like more mostly like seventies and eighties music. I mean, if like just one song with a beat came on, I would have. I would have gone for it. But I was just like, I don't know. I just. Can't, I just can't. I can't fake it. I can't either. It's so hard to do. And it, it makes you feel worse because you look around and everyone's enjoying it. Yeah. Is there something wrong with me? Like, why does... That everyone... also makes you less likely to dance. It's like a cycle, isn't it? It's like, I yeah. wasn't the feeling in the first place. And now that everyone else is enjoying it, I'm not. I feel a bit like... Yeah. 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 I think it's, 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 it's parallels to being when you're in writing sessions. If you don't love the song, 
mm. that you're writing, you know, with the you know top lines of every day. It's quite hard to fake that you're really in very it. hard. It's sort of it's yeah, very, and that's that's kind, but that's a good thing, I think. I think yeah, I agree. You don't I, want to get to the end of the day with a song you don't like. Yeah, and I think that's why it's better to be. Like you guys are pretty open and I think I can, I know if you guys are into something or not. And I think it's better to be like that than quite a sort of, if you were quite sort of cold and I couldn't read you very well, that makes mm. the second really hard. Mm. Yeah, there's I'm some like, people I'm sure we, we all work with, you know, not naming any names, who are so amazingly positive in sessions all mm. the way through. And every single song is the best song ever. And, and, yeah. and the first session you ever do with them, you're like, Wow, it must be really good. The tenth song, you're like, I can't have loved them all. <laughs> There's, yeah. no <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> so it's dawning on you. Hey, maybe time. they do. Maybe they just love all, all the all the songs. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. It's surely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's but session, sessions are a really weird thing for people to kind of get their head, head around. I think it's, I've, I've spoke to a lot of people in music before and explained the kind of process of going into a songwriting session. And, and that it is that's quite a weird process as well. So I, I, I quite often liken it to dating because it's yeah, kind yeah. of like you get put connected with these people and you have to see if you click or not. And mm. it's really it's a really weird process writing. Yeah, and it's sort of yeah, you sort of get it's four hours into a session, you're sitting with people you've never met before, writing about some breakup, you know, none of yeah. you ever had, and you're just like, this is so odd. <laughs> it's like what, what is going on? Yeah, Again, take true. the music out of take music out of the equation. It's one odd thing yeah. to do. It's basically, writing poetry with together. Ther- that's therapy session. That's why it's important to be really open in these situations. I think. I think like if you're quite open with people from the beginning, it will make them feel comfortable. Um, you, you've basically got to make people feel comfortable pretty quickly, haven't you, to get good stuff? I, mean, yeah. I think you've got to make people feel like it's okay to make mistakes as well. Yeah, like if you try and write with someone you've never met before, the best song you've ever met, you know, made, it's so easy to be like critical, and that sort of just makes the whole thing not really work. It's almost like you just got to like fall on your face together as a group a bunch of times to like get there. That's, it's yeah. weird. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's sort of like you, nobody, so few of the big songs and the, the most popular songs of all time were written by people trying to play it safe. It's normally people taking risks, right? And if you're putting room with a stranger your natural thing is to play it safe and do something you know will sort of sound pretty good but probably also sound like a lot of other things you know yeah um, yeah you're not sure what their taste is going to be like but actually like people like stuff that's different it's weird yeah do you guys Probably. go into sessions with starter tracks or with song yeah. ideas or we, do you we both, we both do actually don't we we both have that I, I find personally, I have like loads of starters and I find that even just having the starters there and they're not starter tracks, they're literally just like 15 second loops of things. Yeah. I even find having those there, sometimes I won't even use them, but I know that I've got them in the back pocket and it makes, it just gets rid of all that anxiety of like, oh my God, I need to come up with an idea that's inspiring for these four people right here, right now. And often you, you'll come up with an idea right here, right then, just because you don't have that anxiety. That makes yeah, sense. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, if, if, if we go into a session and like, I feel unprepared for it, it is quite scary. Because the worst thing is if everyone's like sitting there waiting to start writing a song and you're just like, everyone's sort of stare, staring at you to do something. You're just like, all right, then here we go. It's like it's quite, it's quite scary. It can be yeah, quite chord like, anxiety is is a real thing. Chord anxiety <laughs> is a real thing. Still <laughs> trying to frantically click in, like <laughs> I'm similar to you, Lewis. I'm always making sort of song starters. I've got a playlist. Yeah. There's now 678 of them. Wow, wow, that's pretty. So, so many. So I bet, yeah. I bet you, you probably you won't have used obviously you won't have used anywhere near that amount, but it's just almost no. like having those there. It's almost like it's almost like you've done your warm up before you run, yeah. And you kind of you're like ready to go a bit more, um, yeah. And it's sort of if you have loads, it's sort of like you have to like something. 
if I, if, yeah. if they don't like anything, I'm like, I think it's, I think it's more of a major. That's probably. a 679 and you're sweating. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a great way of finding that middle ground with somebody that you've never met that you're meeting for the first time. Cause you're, you're showing them your starter songs. Obviously you like it. And then if they hear something that they like, then it's like, okay, Oh cool. We both like this. Exactly. That's a really, it's a really, really positive way to, to start off. And it's good to make different sounding ones as well because not everyone likes certain types of chords and, you know, minor chords or major chords or jazzy chords or whatever it is. It's good to... I guess sort of going back to what we are saying about, like, you know, you like the music maybe that you liked when you were younger. It's like nobody has the same taste. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's even ones that, you know, you make and you're like, you don't really like it that much. And then somebody hears something in it and starts singing a melody and you're like, Oh wow! This is amazing. this is great. Like, I never have thought, you know, of that. Definitely yeah. agree with that. That's the magic of collaborating: is you've got multiple people looking at the same song from different angles, bringing their own history to it. Songs are always, Sorry. always better that way. Yeah, 100%. definitely. I don't know many people that enjoy writing songs. I don't know anyone that enjoys writing songs on their own. Hmm. The, the more you don't do it, the more it seems hard. You sort of you need validation for your ideas to some extent. Yeah, you know? yeah someone just to be like, "That's great. Let's keep going." Yeah. And you're like, "Okay." Because mm. I think that there's a lot of people who work with me might be so some of them. These people are the most talented people you'll ever meet in your life, but they don't actually also know sometimes when they've just done the best thing ever. They might be playing on the piano and add lib something, and you're like. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. We'll say a lyric and they yeah. might they might put that in. Mm. That's why I always voice note everything you're doing at mm. all times. <laughs> and even now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, guys, we're at the end of the segment. We have to close things up. But it was such a pleasure having you on today. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah thank you. Enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. To the listeners, I want you to check out the song Fever. And guys, well, punctual. What what are your socials for the listeners? So we are Instagram uh, at we are punctual, and the same on Twitter. And that's I think yeah, I think if you just type, type in punctual, I'm pretty sure it'll come up. Or yeah. punctual music. If you type in punctual music, it comes up in Google. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And Lewis, yeah. you're one half of Just Kidding, and also am, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in case you didn't know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, but do you want people to check out Just Kidding or do you, do you have a personal page? Yeah, so I've got my own. So Just Kidding is a project I'm still still doing. Um, so that's that's there. And then I've got my own account, which is Lewis Thompson Music. So I'm an artist as myself now as well. Um, um, so yeah, Lewis Thompson Music. Yeah, go check us out. Thank you for checking out Life Rhythms. We'll see you next time.